Okay, hello everyone. My name is Carl. I'm currently just coming to the end of my second year on the health and social care degree at the University of Derby with an eye to going into social work masters at the end. So let's continue with the introductions. Panel members, if you could tell us your name and what your role is, please. Let's start with Stephen. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Stephen Collis. I'm the Assistant Discipline Lead and Senior Lecturer uh, for Adult Nursing based at the Chesterfield campus of the University of Derby. Thank you. Connor? Hello, I'm Connor. Um, I'm the Deputy Trainer Manager for DHU 111. We provide the NHS 111 service for the East Midlands. Thank you. And David? Hello. I'm a staff nurse at Chesterfield Royal Hospital. I work in a &E. Thank you. Um, Richard? My name's Richard Townsend. I'm a senior practitioner, which is a, a senior social worker with Derbyshire County Council. Thank you. Uh, Nathan? Oh, you just muted, Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Woods, uh, the Chief Executive Officer uh, for Ability Care in Chesterfield. Uh, we look after um, people with learning disabilities within the Derbyshire area. Thank you. And finally, Tim? Uh, hi, I'm Tim Wheeler. I'm uh, what we call a spiritual care practitioner, or used to be called chaplain at Ashgate Hospice. And my former background, I was a uh, community psychiatric nurse for older adults for thousands of years. Lovely. Thank you, everyone. So this event is about talking with a variety of men already holding positions within health and social care. As something that is rarer than we would like, it's worth looking at what brought them to this point. So I'd like to ask the panel to talk for just one minute about how you got involved in health and social care. Was there some specific moment that made you want to do it? So let's start with David. Um, uh, was it me? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, I started um, working in care at 18 years old. Um, started working in people's going from house to house, um, providing care. Um, and it wasn't until I was 26 that I thought um, maybe I could do a bit more. Um, maybe I should give university a shot. So I did. Um, and I've been a staff nurse since. So that's um, three years that I've been qualified now. Um, I started working on an admission unit at Chesterfield Royal Hospital. Um, very fast paced, very challenging at times, but I do believe it's developed me um, to be the, the nurse I am today. And I've just recently moved to A&E. So that's my background in a nutshell. Thank you. Nathan? Uh, first I into uh, health and social care um, through uh, sport when we were at college. Um, we used to run um, sporting events for people with learning disabilities. So I went through college onto university um, with the aim to be um, a PE teacher. Um, when I went on to do a PGC, I applied for the role of a support worker um, and got back into health and social care that way. Uh, from there, I've moved up in positions um, through to a uh, team leader role, uh, looking after your staff team on the shop floor, uh, working up to operations side, um, and now working as the chief executive uh, for the whole charity. Um, I got involved in that through a young age and looking at the barriers in which uh, my cousin faced um, but as she is uh, disabled um, and working towards how we can break those barriers down to make it uh, a more accessible place for people to learn disabilities in our community. Thank you. And Stephen? Hi, yep. Yeah, um, I think like with many people actually, my um, my introduction to healthcare was through personal experience. Um, my father died um, in a hospice when I was a teenager and even then, I remember seeing the vast uh, array of uh, different staff members, different roles in health and social care from different backgrounds, obviously men and women, and the impact that had both on the care of my father, but also the support to uh, family, such as myself and friends. And 
Um, I think already then, you know, I knew that that's something I wanted to do to help others. Um, health and social care particularly, there was a vast variety of roles available. I remember talking to people and they talked about clinical practice or research, management and education, which is uh, where I've ended up. Um, and, and that really interested me as well, that it was just so varied and there were so many opportunities available. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so, Connor. Thank you. Yeah, um, my career started when I was 16. Um, I was signed up for the British Army and I, my main choices were either infantry or a combat medical technician, two very different uh, routes in the British Army. And I had to make a decision uh, and I decided that the, uh, being a medic uh, suited my nature more, thinking about treating casualties and, and uh, primary care patients. Um, and it was a good decision. I'm glad I made it because I, I'm 14 years on. I'm still within the, the health sector working in NHS 111. Um, I'm glad I made the decision. Um, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Uh, and in my future, I can't imagine doing anything else either. Thank you. And uh, Tim? Yeah, so for me, it was one of those things that uh, happened over a long period of time. I, I took um, a gap year. Um, and uh, I worked in a youth and community centre and at the youth and community centre um, the adolescent unit from the local um, psychiatric services came and used the facilities and long story short I ended up getting a job with them but that just opened up um, a whole array of what was happening in, in mental health and psychiatry so um, this was back in the 80s so I've seen the sort of closure of big hospitals and there's been a, a massive change in um, in, in what's going on but my, my real love was working with older people um, and uh, so when I qualified I just really enjoyed working with older people and ended up uh, working primarily with older people for the rest of my career not, not solely but primarily um, and that, that was a real joy I was able to take uh, and during that time I also trained as a lay reader in the Church of England which is basically uh, uh, somebody who's trained to, to lead services without becoming a vicar um, and uh, just two elements of my life, my spiritual side and my uh, nursing side, I just wanted to come together. And um, when I was able to take a pension, um, opportunities arose at the Ashgate Hospice. And now, um, four and a half years later from starting to volunteer, I now have um, uh, a full-time job as a, as a chaplain or spiritual care practitioner, um, which is incredibly fulfilling. And, and again, like everybody else says, it's just very varied. It's, Every day is a different day. It's amazing. Thank you. And um, Richard? Thank you. Yeah, there was no one particular moment I could pinpoint in my life that got me involved in, in working um, in social care or social work. But when I was younger, I started working in, um, working in residential settings with, with children and then um, moving on to working with people with mental health problems, again, in residential um, settings. Um, but I always found that I, I enjoyed working with people. I like talking and getting paid for it as well. Uh, and I found that I had a, had a great affinity to, to connect with people who are often in, in, um, in very, uh, in periods of crisis in their life. So um, I, I always enjoyed it. And then I sort of carried on and, and, and moved into to, to becoming a qualified social worker. Um, just led me into my post now, which is working with adults with, with learning disability and autism. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and just to give everyone an idea of how I came into it, uh, when I was younger, I was uh, affected by disability that meant I had to stop going to school. I got involved in a community of people with that disability. And there I found I was good at listening, but I didn't know what to say to people. So that led me into counselling, which I completed over a number of years. My health improved. Um, from there, I worked at a disability charity in various paid and voluntary roles, which sadly closed down. So I played for a job with a local authority, one of the adult care teams. And after a year, I loved working with other professionals in social care, something that counselling didn't always involve. And along with being frustrated at my lack of being able to do more within the system, I decided to go to university. So I think there's some great experiences and journeys there from everybody. It really shows that a journey in health and social care can start anywhere. So now we've got you here, I'd like to know for just a couple of minutes each, please, what your role involves. So let's start with Stephen. 
Uh, hi, yeah. Um, it's a very varied role, uh, role. So at the minute, being an assistant discipline lead um, at a university, um, my job is to line manage um, a team of senior lecturers. So that means inspiring, supporting them, developing them, making sure we get the best out of them so they can then teach our future um, nursing workforce to get uh, give good patient care or great patient care. Um, but I'm also still working as a senior lecturer as part of that role. So I am involved in teaching and that's sort of um, lectures and online teaching as well at the moment, as well as simulation, uh, clinical skills training. I'm involved in assessments, so you know, marking assignments and uh, developing students in that way as well, writing papers for journals. So I've obviously got to keep up to date with research myself. Um, so that's really my sort of university role as well as supporting students out in clinical placements and that's with all our uh, different partners throughout Derbyshire and wider. Um, but being a, a registered nurse means I'm able to also still work with patients so I do um, pick up shifts at the weekend at the local hospital uh, working with patients. And, uh, and involved, in fact, um, very recently been involved in the vaccination effort. So um, being part of the vaccination clinics for COVID. So uh, again, it's, I've had a great opportunity and I'm, I'm very lucky to, to have such a, a varied role that I've got now. Brilliant, thank you. You must have been very busy over the last year. I certainly have. Uh, so, Connor. Thank you. So yeah, working within NHS 111, um, first and foremost, uh, I still work as a health advisor which involves uh, answering calls from members of the public who are injured, unwell, just unsure of what to do with their health problem. Um, and we triage that problem and direct them to where they should be, where would be most appropriate for them to be seen. Um, I don't do that so much anymore. Um, I've progressed on to work with the training team. So uh, as a deputy training manager, um, I'm responsible for planning uh, new intakes of people who are wanting to join the company uh, to, to do the health advisor role. Um, and another big part of my role is, is quality improvement. So working, we use a system called NHS Pathways um, and we work with the, the uh, national NHS Pathways training team to improve the system so that it's more effective um, for patients in the future. Um, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, David. Um, so I'm um, a staff nurse, uh, like I said, I've recently moved to a &E, so um, currently my role is to um, assess patients as they're coming in, um, either that have walked in or have been brought in by ambulance, um, do bloods, um, we do all necessary procedures that need to happen and then we'll move them on to another area, um, depending on what area you're in. Um, or allocated throughout the shift, you could be um, transferring patients throughout the hospital, um, or you could be working in the resource room. So um, this is where your extremely unwell patients come in from um, outside. So whether these people present in A&E and then become unwell, or they're brought in by ambulance and need um, urgent care straight away. Um, throughout my experience, I've um, spent a couple of years working an, as an admission nurse. Um, so they come to us from A&E, um, get all relevant information from them that helps um, the nursing team, the doctors to provide the right level of care for this patient. Um, and that's my role really. Um, I deal a lot with other um, members of the multidisciplinary team, so doctors, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. Um, so it's not just working with the patient in hospital, it's also trying to prepare them to um, be discharged home so that everything's safe for them. Um, a lot of people need district nurses once they get home. So it's making sure that all relevant steps have been put in place so that they can return home safely um, or if need be, um, assisting them to stay into hospital for the length of stay that's required. So that's me. It sounds like a lot of work behind the scenes rather than what we just see face to face. So thank you. Um, Richard, would you like to go next? Yeah, I work with adults who've got either a learning disability and or autism, um, but who've got challenging behaviour as well. Um, and what we try and do in our team is to implement something called Transforming Care, which was um, a government scheme set up 
after the something called the Winterbourne Hospital scandal, which which is about nine ten years old ago, which was where a number of people abused horrifically, and it was shown on the Panorama program. So. Um, my role at the moment is, is about working with people who are at risk of being admitted into hospital and working to try and get people who are in hospital, that's, so that's mental health hospitals and specialist hospitals for people who are interested in autumn, to get them out of those hospitals, to get them back into the communities in which they live. Um, so we work to balance, often to balance risk in the community with, with, the, with what people want. Um, I assess people for um specific packages of care and also assess people's ability to make decisions as well um, and that's sometimes very significant when we're looking at risk management issues we work with something called court of protection which is the courts in this country um, for people who can't make their decisions themselves um, uh, we work in teams of people as well so it's not just a social worker on their own so so anyone that we work with would have, have a multidisciplinary team around them, which would often include psychiatrists, nurses, of lots of different disciplines of nursing, occupational therapy, speech and language therapists. Police are often quite a large part of our, our teams as well. Um, and I do a case management role, so I still do hands-on work, as it were, with, with people as well. So that is it briefly, what, what my job entails at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Another one that must have been quite a challenge with everything over the last year. So, next, Nathan. Thank you. Um, over the last sort of 12, 18 months, I think I've taken on about three or four different hats with, within our organisation. Um, but mainly it's to work with our board of trustees um, to look at our aims and objectives for the charity um, going forward for the next 12 months. Um, we work together uh, to make sure that we're setting out the right aims and objectives that are going to um, benefit the, the local community, um, our beneficiaries and uh, individuals that are involved uh, within our charity. Um, I oversee the senior management team uh, within our organisation um, and oversee a staff team um, of about 80 uh, support workers. Um, on top of that, we're also looking at the operations side of the charity. We're looking at um, new sites, um, new initiatives that are out there that we can uh, facilitate and uh, support our staff teams to um, be involved in, set up, and um, hopefully that um, then gives our beneficiaries the options to um, attend um, any of our multi-sites that we have. Um, and then we have the, the HR side of things, uh, setting out policies and procedures um, for the charity, um, adhering to safeguarding policies, um, and also creating safe environments for individuals in our community so that they are accessing uh, safe spaces and are um, governed. Um, we work closely with Derbyshire County Council um, with a lot of contracts um, that we support, um, and that's, that's what I do. Thank you. That's quite a lot of hats you're wearing there. Okay. And uh, finally, Tim, please. Uh, so it's one of those difficult ones. How do you do it in two minutes? I don't know. Um, so a spiritual care practitioner or chaplain, um, what we do is we are there. Um, it's probably the best way of doing it. The previous chaplain said, you know, I said, what model do you use? And he says, loitering with intent. Everybody else goes in to see people because they've got a job to do. Our job is to be there for people. Spirituality is, is, is partly religion, but it's also partly what makes somebody tick. And I think one of the, the joys I have, it's a real privilege to work with people in the last year, months, weeks, days, even hours of their life, to, to allow people, allow me in, into their lives. It's just incredible. And sometimes, like this, somebody at the hospital at the moment, Sacramentally, they need things like a, a Roman Catholic priest, and that might be, and we help them with that. Uh, other people will say, you know, their spirituality is things like, um, I was talking to a relative, what do they like? You know, gardening. So how can I bring a garden into the, the bedroom? That's what I want to do. If that's what's going to make that person click. I used to think as a psychiatric nurse, my first job 
uh, was my first role was to bring hope to people and that hopefully would bring peace. Um, but I think as a, a, as a chaplain, as a spiritual care practitioner, my role in this, in Ashgate particularly, is to bring a sense of peace to people, resolving things. There may be theological issues that people, you know, what happens when I die? What um, I stole from my granny, will I see her in heaven? You know, um, we haven't got time to talk about all the, all the, what are some of the best questions we get is, I don't believe in God, but. You know, um, so we also help people to grieve, to mourn, you know, um, and that, that might be in a systematic way, like uh, having a service or a, a, on a, a non-religious ceremony. But it also might just be about giving people time or sometimes just sitting with people. Okay, thank you. I, I think sometimes we can forget the simple benefit of just simply being there. Mm. Okay, thank you, everyone. So let's now explore the topic of men in health and social care a bit more in depth. I've got some questions here that I'm going to ask some of the panel members. The first one is looking at it directly. So why do you think fewer men than women choose to work in health and social care? Stephen, would you like to go first? Yeah, it's a, a really good question. Um, I think being honest, most people when they're in their formative years, um, sort of a, ch a child, teenager, and they're thinking about what career, other than looking on telly and wanting to be a, a pop star or an actor. I think most of us look to our, our role models, don't they? they? Look to our parents or the elders in our family and friendship groups uh, and see what jobs they do and, and does that fit with us? Um, and being really honest, most health and social care jobs and nursing for me um, were held by, by women in the past. So as, as a boy, as a, a young man, it probably wasn't even thought of as an option. It wasn't there, it wasn't there to be discussed. Um, I'm hoping as more men come into health and social care, that will automatically change. It'll spark some interest, spark conversations. People have role models who are men in health and social care. Um, but no, I do think that's that's a big influence. So in the meantime, I think what we need to do is have more conversations about what we do, what our jobs involve, and make sure that that's um, as, where as possible in the media, in mainstream, and talked about in, in schools with children. So there's lots of uh, stereotypes and overcoming that, isn't it? And have you noticed a difference recently with more men coming in? Uh, certainly. I mean, with, particularly with nursing, um, when I did my nurse training many, many, many years ago, um, I, I think I was one of two uh, men in the group. Now it's still by no means at 50%, and that's a big shame. That's where I'd like to see it. Um, but I'd say a good 10, 15% of our student nurses are, are men, um, which is fantastic. Um, what we can do to, to increase that, we're all working together. And this, these sorts of conversations and events will really help with that, hopefully. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, uh, Nathan, why, why do you think fewer men and women choose to work in this field? Um, I mean, totally agree uh, with the previous comments made. Um, personally, when um, you, you're growing up, you're in your teenage years, yes, you look towards your role models, but also you look towards um, what careers you're actually given uh, as options when you're at school, when you're at colleges. Now, um, I can't, um, for me, I don't ever remember a time where um, health and social care was was given as an option. You, you're more pushed towards... Um, football or sports or um, engineering, IT, things like that. Um, and I think it's a very underestimated um, sector and I don't think it's publicised enough or I don't think enough people are pushed within health and social care at those, those early ages, um, especially in schools, colleges, um, as you're, you're building, building your way up to uh, which career you'd like. Um, and even looking back at it when you was at college on health and social care courses, there was very rarely any, any males that actually um, took those qualifications on. And even now, when we go into uh, the workplace that we work in, we're still struggling massive. That's probably say that we've got 10% males, 90% females um, within our support worker roles. Um, and until, well, what I think personally, until health and social care is pushed and recognised and given um, the creditability it deserves, um, I think at that point we will then see more, more males working within health and social care. 
And what difference would it, it make to your organisation to have more men? Uh, I think it'd be um, a fantastic addition, to be fair. Um, you got to, I mean, for us, you you make things as person-centred as you possibly can um, with every um, sort of uh, care package that, that you'd like to deliver. And within that, you do get a lot of um, individuals that like to choose their own staff teams, for example. Um, and people say, oh, I, I want to work with two males, just an example. And sometimes it's so difficult to put those um, person-centred care packages together based on what staff we actually have. Um, so an influx of, of male support work would be absolutely fantastic. So an increase of choice and control, which is what it's all about being person-centred. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, Connor, where would you like to go next, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think it really comes down to old uh, gender biases and, and stereotypes. So being in a profession, um, in a profession where you care about people and, and you're looking after people is, is a sign of, of weakness. And I, I think it comes down to the, the British, the English culture of, uh, you know, caring for people is, is seen as weakness. And that's probably in, in the younger years when people are starting to look at their education and the careers they go into, probably when they're not so wise. Um, when in, in reality, being in a position where you care for people, um, you know, deal with people who are in pain and suffering is an incredibly difficult thing to do and, and not a, a weak, weak side at all. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work in, in, on a team where we've got a 50-50 split of, of men and women, which is, is great to see. But on the call centre floor, it is still predominantly women. And, and I have asked myself in the past and I have thought about it. Why, why is that difference? Because I, I never questioned it as a, as a uh, profession when I, when I left the army. Um, but it, even within the army, uh, working as a medic, there was predominantly women. And uh, every now and again, I would uh, adopt the nickname Sheila, where people were disappointed when I would join their unit and I was not a woman. Um, so yeah, I think it really comes down to the old stereotype. I'm, I'm hoping it get, gets washed away as we are uh, evolving as a um, society. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think it's a, it's a down to the old stereotype. And I agree with you. It's, it's something that, you know, if you say you're doing health and social care profession, you automatically get the questions or that's not a man's job, but it's, it's nice to see events like this where it's the barriers are coming down slowly. So, David, can I ask the same question of you, please? Um, as well as being a staff nurse, I am um, during my training set up a, um, a support network because, as Stephen said, um, like there was only two men in his um, cohort of nurses. I think there was about 12 of us out of 188. Um, so we set up this support network to try and um, help other men that were doing nursing as, as a degree. Um, to, to have that sort of um, ability to talk to another bloke. Um, and through this, I've done some research and it looks like it's been 11% of the um, nursing and midwifery um, council register of nurses um, is men. And it's been about that. It goes up and down um, a few percent but it looks like it's been around 11% of the register for the last 30 years. Um, and I sort of summarised that there's some negative um, stigmas or um, perceptions related to uh, men that choose to be a nurse. And a lot of it has showed itself to me throughout my training. And um, I think a lot of people assume that if you choose nursing as a man, you're effeminate. And I think that's one of the big reasons that puts people off because it's not seen as a masculine role um, to look after someone, to, to wash someone that needs help. Um, but to think about it as a, as a bigger picture, you're providing that care for someone in, from the first day of life through to the very last um that it takes a lot of courage um a lot of it 
um, is related to men thinking that if they join this profession, they will go straight to the top. Um, that's one of the negative connotations that I've seen from um, female colleagues that have said, oh, you'll go far um, because you're a man. So I do think there are negatives portrayed to it, which is probably one of the reasons why a lot of people don't choose um, nursing as a career. So that's, that's me. Thank you very much. So I'm sure that there are a few men watching who are considering making that first step into health and social care. So the next question is, why do you think encouraging more men into health and social care is important? Tim, would you like to answer this one first, please? I think it's important because you've, you've got a gift. Uh, you, you're, first of all, you're human. Um, and I think often, going slightly back to the, old, the last question, I think um, a lot of reason why men don't go in is because we're not included in the conversation uh, about caring and things like this. And I think also we, we tend not to, we have, a, men tend to talk less than women, uh, controversial, but there's some research that shows that. Um, and we therefore have a smaller vocabulary. So it takes us longer to talk about our feelings. But um, what I found is that we're getting in the spiritual care practitioner team, we've got the chaplaincy team, we're getting volunteers and at the moment we've got a couple of blokes. Um, as one of them, uh, he's an engineer by training, he's a bit bluff, he's a bit, um, you know, he started helping out with us um, about two years ago in, in a bereavement group. And then he started, he moved over to the spiritual care team. And I've watched him blossom over this COVID year. I've been giving him um, supervision. And he's just come out more and more and more out of himself. And he said, you know, two years ago, I couldn't see myself in a caring profession. Um, but now he says, actually, I can see myself in a caring profession. And um, because he's blossomed, he's had time to, to, to experience being in, in, in a caring caring place, engaging with people at, at their most vulnerable. Um, and I think there's this saying, which I wish I could find. Um, I think it's uh, Nelson Mandela says, who are you to not share your gifts with the world, you know, your, your personality, your gift? And I think as men, um, we, we have a lot of uh, gifts because we're people. Um, my, my colleague that I was just telling you about, um, he's, he's an engineer. And one of the reasons he's able to come alongside a lot of men, whereas a lot of the, the women find it harder, is because he's worked where they've worked. He's lived where they've lived. The spirituality isn't all about flowers and the birds and nature and things. Spirituality can be about engines, oil, cars. And he gets alongside people in a way that other people can't because he's got that background. So um, I think we have things to offer as men, even though we may say it doesn't we don't fit in uh, into that and I, I i challenge that i challenge that perception if, if you if you're like if you've got uh, if you're alive and breathing i'm sure there's part of you that can care thank you i'm, I'm hearing there the importance of self-growth as well as helping others mm. so thank you um richard I think Tim's a hard act to follow, actually. Um, he's, he's just made some brilliant points there. Um, I'd say having more men in health and social care is, is really helpful because um, we, we've got often quite diverse work teams anyway. So having more men just adds to that. Um, I think having men, it, I, I, I'd welcome it because I, I think it does fit. I think we've got an opportunity in this post COVID era to look at how we want society and everyone was out there last year clapping on the front doorsteps at 7 p.m. on a Thursday evening, clapping for carers. You know, how, how can we actually use that goodwill to um, our professions and, and actually take it forward? And part of that is, is, is by having, having more men into the profession. Um, and, and I think it also fits something as well that generally there's a national sort of narrative around uh, uh, people generally but men specifically talking about when things go wrong and talking about mental health um particularly but um yeah and i, and I think also that, that you know, going back to the early question um 
briefly as well. I think that, that in general, there's sort of misconception that somehow, certainly working in so, social work is some kind of fluffy type profession, but it, it's often very gritty work and the people who are in social work and, and colleagues in nursing and other, you know, associated health professions that need to be very resilient and very strong. So the, the, the traditional gender biases and, and this, this thing about it being being somehow allied to women who are somehow perceived to be, you know, some effeminate type thing. It's, it's, it's just absolute nonsense. Thank you. Thank you. So the more diversity we have increases the quality of care and experiences to we can all offer. So thank you. Uh, David? Um, for me, I see it as the fact that um, in the nursing workforce, there's about 40% of um, our workforce is the vacant posts. So to have more men um, joining the, the profession would help staff um, the shifts. It also would help patients have that preference of um, which gender they'd want to look after them. Um, I get a lot of um, a lot of staff asking me if I'll put um, a catheter in a male patient or assist um, a man to a toilet um, because they don't really want a lady to help them. Um, so it helps with their privacy and the, providing dignity to them, which is what we're supposed to do as professionals. Um, I also think that. I've heard a lot of staff saying that it does benefit the shift when it's not all one gender at work. And I do sometimes think that it it can break the conversation up um, depending on of if it's someone who, who does a chat or who doesn't, that just goes to work and gets on with their job or someone that'll um, sit and have a chat over a coffee. Um, so I do think it makes a difference. And going back to role models, um, I, through uh, the work that I do alongside my role, go out into schools um, and talk to children. This is pre-COVID um, about careers. And a lot of the time I've been told, you can't be a nurse, you're a man, or they automatically presume I'm a doctor. So having more men in my workforce would help strengthen those role models. Thank you. And that, that perfectly linked in with what Nathan said earlier about increasing personalization options for service users. So building on from the last question, um, the next one is, how has being a man influenced your health and social care career? And can you share an occasion when you felt proud to be a man in a health and social care role? And um, for this one, let's start with Stephen. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a difficult one about, you know, it, specifically why being a man. But I think as an individual, I think, um, as Tim said before, we are, we're individuals, we're as humans, we're, as people, we bring a whole raft of, um, you know, important parts of our background, our culture, our understanding. So, you know, when I'm at work, I'm, yes, I'm a man, but, you know, I also bring with me my age, my race, my sex, sexuality, gender, all of those things are, are important. And I think having, a, a you know, a mix of those, those backgrounds means we can, you know, share understanding and um, make sure that patients' individualised uh, needs are met. We've got that understanding of those needs. We can challenge, we can ensure that from frontline care right to policy making and strategy making that, you know, that men's uh, needs are, are met as well as, as all those other uh, uh, variables that I mentioned before. So I do think um, having a, a variety of backgrounds is, is vital and it certainly has been important to me in my career. Um, about a moment of being proud, um, I guess a couple of things, again, touching on the word role model, I know we keep using some of the similar words, actually. Um, I have had healthcare assistants that have come to um, work at the hospital. They didn't know what else to do. Some uh, male healthcare assistants that have worked alongside me and then gone on to do their nurse their nurse training, become registered nurses, and said that, you know, they felt that um, I was a role model and it inspired them to do that, which is really humbling. Um, and also, so even in education now, I've got a couple of uh, junior uh, male colleagues 
who have seen or, or you know their perception of my my achievements and feel um you know that they didn't have those role models they didn't they didn't see that um, what was possible for them as men in in nursing and in education so very niche um but actually again they they feel that um having that that role model having that um that, that different person doing a different role has helped inspire them so of course those moments have made me feel very proud brilliant thank you very much so tim sorry i wasn't <laughs> expecting you to come quite so quickly though. i'm now on muted i'm not sure that there's a particular moment where i feel particularly proud but i think there's been times when you go actually they go yeah yeah this this was good because i've been able to break some barriers I've been able to uh, help as, as a mental health nurse. Um, I've been able to help women understand their men and, and vice versa. Um, I think that's been useful uh, because I think women and men tend to, uh, obviously this is a broad stroke, brush stroke uh, statement I'm just about to make, tend to think in different ways. Um, and, and just helping people to understand that, I think that's, that's uh, important. I think there's also been times where um, recently somebody said, I'd, I'd like to speak to a man, please, um, if possible, because I'm just surrounded by women all the time and it would just be nice to talk to somebody that I feel would be on relatively the same wavelength. Uh, so I think that's been a really important, uh, I think that's a, a, an important issue uh, or offer that, that you can make. So, yeah, I think that's probably the best answer I can come with at the time. Thank you. Thank you both. Some very inspiring stories there. So an important goal of today's session is to introduce you to men already established within their health and social care careers. So the next question to the panelists is, have you ever had a, a role model in your life that helped you encourage you into your health and social care roles? And for this one, I'd like to start with Connor. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've got a big role model um, in my life. Uh, he is uh, my cousin. He was a paramedic. Uh, I kind of followed in his footsteps to join the army. Um, and when he left the army, he uh, became a paramedic. And he is the very idea you have of a big butch man. You know, he's covered in tattoos, big beard. And the stories used to tell me of, of the empathy he would show for his patients and, and the care and how it affected him. You know, it, it really inspired me that, you know, this this person who I see as a man's man doing such a, a caring role, it, it, it made me think, you know, I, I could, could could go on to do something um, and, and not see it as a negative thing. I, I like to think I'm quite awakened in the way that I've, um, the way I think even when I was younger. Um, but yeah, he's definitely been a, a big inspiration for me. And, and just the, the opportunities he's had, you know, he, he has been hardworking. He's kept up with his education, and starting off as a paramedic maybe 20 years ago. Um, he's now working as a, uh, a primary care practitioner in, in a GP practice. So just the opportunities that are available as well. It's such a diverse um, world of, you know, within health and social care, things that you can do. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And Richard? I can't say that there's ever been a role model in my life that has uh, encouraged me into this area. Um, it's quite strange how I ended up this way, but um, I, I kind of wished that there, that there was a role model. I think it would have made the path a bit, bit easier um, to come into it. But um, yeah, a short answer from me. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Uh, so Nathan, can I start with you, please? Again, yeah, probably the same for me because I came into it. Um, later on until I was sort of 2021 20, um, when I came into health and social care it wasn't as if it was a um, a role that I'd looked that I'd actually wanted to do going forward so I kind of took that leap into health and social care taking my first job as a support worker without great knowledge or background or of role models within within that kind of sector um, I wouldn't have been able to name anybody within that sector at that point. Um, but I suppose working um, in that environment, especially for the first couple of years um, for myself, you had role models um, all around you with the other staff members that, that you were working with. Um, 
And I think to be able to build up your experience, um, your qualities, and be able to make a difference to individuals' lives by um, learning off, off the staff team that you're with um, was a fantastic learning platform um, and something to look up to and look forward to, um, which I believe has enabled my progression um, going forward into the role that I'm a, I am now. Okay, thank you. And uh, finally, Stephen, you talked about a bit about becoming a role model yourself. So, can you talk about some of your role models? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, I say my first experience um, going into to a hospice environment as a, as a teenager, and actually seeing a variety of people. So. Um, nurses, carers, occupational therapists, dietitians, physiotherapists, doctors, both male and female. And actually, um, that was a great experience because up to that point, I think just looking in books, uh, watching TV, I'd seen middle-aged, middle-class, white, heterosexual women doing all of those roles, apart from the doctor, of course, you know, and it was, it was great for that to be challenged. And um, I think it, there's nothing to say that we shouldn't have lots of uh, middle-aged, middle-class, white, heterosexual women in nursing and other careers, there certainly are but we need to make it much more varied. And I think there aren't, and I think a couple of you have said that you didn't feel there was a role model. And I think what's really important then is what can we do to change that? So we are the role models for the next generation. And that's certainly what brought me into education is I want to, I want to inspire the future generation of people working in health and social care. That's brilliant. That's, that's very well said um, and leads us perfectly onto the next question. So, for men who are considering a move into the field, if you were giving careers advice, would you recommend a career in health and social care? And if so, what one piece of advice would you give? So let's go around and start with David, please. I would 100% say um, that coming into health and social care is the right thing to do. As we've already said, there are hundreds of different jobs that you could do. Um, depending on what previous experience you've got, what transferable skills you have. Um, a lot of the time, it's pretty much talking to people that you will do in the current job you've got. Um, I worked in a betting shop before I started doing care. So it's, it's talking to people and it's pretty much the same as talking to people while you're providing care for them. Um, if you've got them skills, then definitely, um think about applying um i had to go and do um access to nursing course um to get the grades to go into uh, university um as it was a long time since i'd left school but there's many different ways of of trying to get a nursing degree now um and i'm sure there's many other ways of um getting into other aspects of health and social care Brilliant. thank That's you me. Uh, Connor. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my, my advice for anyone when it, uh, thinking about getting into health and social care, uh, I think Dave said it very well then, but there's such a, a, a vast, diverse you know, field to go into that there's careers for anyone. Um, and I, I've never looked back and regretted any decision that I've made uh, when it comes to my careers um, looking after patients and, and triaging people um, so my advice would be don't hesitate um, I, I can't think of anyone who I know of who works within the field who has seen it as a mistake um, and there's so many opportunities for progression uh, no matter what you know look at the, the uh, great panel that we've got here the diversity that's shown um, some roles that I, I didn't, didn't really know um, existed um, so yeah there's so many different things to do don't don't hesitate. Thank you. It's like what Tim said before about the space for personal growth as well as helping others. So thank you. Uh, Richard? I'd say absolutely go for it. I, it the, we talk about social work with, with great passion, really. It's very, very interesting role. It can be very rewarding. It can be very stressful. Um, but it's a good thing to get up for in the morning. Um, there's other benefits about the, the, the jobs themselves. It's often a good fit with family life. You're often working in very supportive teams. So if you like teamwork, it's, it's a good good position, good good job to be in. Um, 
very good career stability. Um, these all these jobs that we talked about this evening, you'll never get furloughed from them. Um, there's great career progression, um, and and really, I, when I speak to people about my role, what I do day to day, people, you know, my mates don't talk about work. I think you know, talk with lads, all sorts of people. They they they're very impressed. They're so interested. So it does. It, it, you know, there's some kudos to it as well. So yeah, go for it. Thank you. I think that great answer and highlighted the importance of the role. So uh, Nathan, would you like to go, please? Yeah. Again, one hundred percent recommend getting in with the health and social care sector. Uh, I mean, the, the personal satisfaction that you can get out of it. The difference that you can make to um, many different people's lives and the impact that you have on individuals um, that you don't actually recognize yourself. Um, you only have to do the list of things to to reap huge rewards. Um, and um, even speaking with the, uh, the staff team prior to, to this earlier, um, so many would again recommend the health and social care setting now there's a hundred thousand vacancies out there for support workers and care workers up and down the country um and um a lot of um individuals are crying out for that help um and once you're into it you're sucked into it and it's been the best nine years um that i've had uh, being able to put um what i've learned um, and the experiences that I've been through now uh, to be able to be um, the person that makes those decisions that um, is able to make a difference within our community uh, and to help support um, those that do face barriers on a, on a daily basis and to be able to see um, the, the difference that that makes, makes it such uh, a fantastic profession to be involved in. Amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, Tim? I'd be uh, asking people, if somebody came to me and said, you know, well, I'd like to get into healthcare, you know, I'd be saying, okay, brilliant. What floats your boat? Why do you want to do this? What excites you? Because um, there's so many jobs that you can be doing. What, what excites you? What makes you passionate? What makes you go, yeah, I need to do this? What challenges me? I'd, I'd help people explore that. And, and then maybe suggest getting a job uh, in, in a care setting uh, at first, because obviously that gives you more of, you know, idea of what, what possibilities there are. And um, I, I was talking to our chef uh, at the hospice earlier this week, and I came away inspired. Um, I don't, I see, until Monday, I didn't think of chefs as healthcare workers. Um, but he was just telling me about the holistic view he uses of food to get people better. The spiritual side of food, the actual nutritional side of food, and then the carers, uh, the relatives who come in. He, he said, um, you know, somebody comes, uh, okay, we we'll just closed the kitchen down. And they said, we've just traveled a long way. We're, we're desperate, really, just need something to eat. And he goes, do you know what? It's not going to take me long. And, and he just... He just gave that bit of love, that bit of tender, loving care and provided a meal uh, for these, these people. He said, you know what? It's not going to cost me a lot to stay on a little longer. So I'd say, what floats your boat? What do you like giving and what do you like receiving? And then, and then we'll explore it further. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And finally, Stephen. Um, yes, I'd wholeheartedly uh, recommend a, a career in, in health and social care. I don't regret mine for a second. Um, I'd be asking two questions, very similar, I guess. Um, I'd be asking, you know, do you want a career that's rewarding and be improving people's lives? And do you want a career that's varied? Um, I, people still ask me now, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I've got a lot of growing up to do yet. And, you know, having an experience and a qualification in healthcare. I've still got such an you know, enormous uh, range of options ahead of me in terms of where I want to work in a hospital setting, in a community setting, virtually using technology, education, management, clinical, you know, there's so many options. So what I'd say is if you're thinking about doing it, go and talk to some men out there and get applying. Brilliant answer, thank you. So 
thank you to all the panelists for today and to Kate and everyone at Community Chesterfield for their work in putting together this event. It's been a really interesting discussion with some amazing things to say. I hope our viewers are leaving with an increased interest and confidence in entering the field. It can be an extremely rewarding career path and I hope the passion of the panelists has been an inspiration to you all today. Thank you.